Here we go. So uh, welcome everyone to the final chemistry seminar for this uh, academic year. Um, I've been looking forward to this seminar actually for two years, <laughs> um, not just for this uh, school year. So it's an honor to be uh, in the presence, even if virtual, um, to learn from a remarkable, accomplished, and influential woman in Seventh-day Adventist higher education. And uh, many of you online are already um, familiar with her, Professor Olive J. Williams of Washington Ad uh, Adventist University. So before I get into, uh, before you, you hear from her, I wanted to just sort of summarize what we've done for this, uh, this year uh, in our seminar program. So first of all, this is the 58th, the 58th, 58th anniversary of our department's annual guest lecture series. So this lecture series is just a little bit younger than me. <laughs> it's been around for a while. Um, over the course of this year, we've had 19 guest speakers. Our speakers came from around the world, including the United States, Canada, Australia, Malaysia, Sweden, and Switzerland. And um, their affiliations are also varied. Uh, just a few of them, um, Pace Labs, Dow Chemical Company, uh, Southern Methodist University, York University in Canada, Princeton University, Rutgers, uh, University of California, University of Sydney, University of Notre Dame are some of, of the affiliations. Presentation topics this past year included presentations on asthma, immortal cells, forever chemicals, green chemistry, electron flow, um, conversion of carbon dioxide into useful materials, astrochemistry, biodegradation of plastics, and a couple more, a few more. And so today we'll be closing out this uh, year's presentations with um, a very special um, lecture dealing with the intersection of science and theology. Um, in terms of introduction, our speaker today is the chair, Olive Professor Hemmings, is the chair of the Henry and Sharon Fordham Department of Religion at Washington Adventist University. She's been teaching in um, higher education, SDA higher education since 1982. Her master's is from Andrews University. It was in New Testament and Biblical Languages. Her PhD is from Claremont Graduate University, um, and it was in the area of theology, ethics, and culture. She is an ordained minister of the Columbia Union Conference, and she has a very busy schedule of preaching and teaching and writing and publishing, um, especially on topics of current ethical concerns in church and society. Uh, she has presided over the Adventist Society of Religious Studies. And in 2022, she joined the Georgetown University ACPE uh, chaplaincy program to develop pastoral spiritual care and competence. And this has been a very rewarding and transforming journey um, for her. So our speaker today is Professor Olive Hemmings. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Is it my time? Yes, it's your time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Murray. And um, uh, you had quite um, many weeks of some uh, really mind-blowing scientific understandings and I of course I'm not a scientist That's <laughs> and all right. dabbling that area 
except where it helps me to understand certain things a little better. So yes, <laughs> we theologians do dabble in science. Some of us dabble the wrong way, but <laughs> let's see how it goes. Um, uh, so we pray that God will guide this conversation and and that it will be uplifting uh, in some way or other. So tensions continue to arise between religious communities and scientific community. Um, these tensions are both, I'll, I'll say, inter-community and intra-community. Inter-community tensions occur between the faith community and an outside non-religious community, while those inter community tensions occur between theologians and the scientific discipline within a faith community like this one. So you can have inter-community tensions here. Now, in the case of Christianity, the Bible becomes the site of judgment. <laughs> mm -hmm. While for the theologian, the Bible is the vehicle of divine revelation. For the scientist, Scientific discoveries reveal the mysteries of the universe. Which revelation is divine and which is not? <laughs> is the source of biblical revelation different from the source of scientific discoveries? What is the subject of the Bible and what is the subject of scientific inquiry? And this is a big question. What is the extent of the authority of scriptures over the scientific discipline? So let us look at these questions as best we can, given the scope of this conversation. Now, let us see. To the to the left, I think. Oh, I think I messed up. My, yeah. <laughs> messed up my presentation. <laughs> Let me stop sharing and start again. I messed up my. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Okay, what did I do? Let's see what I did here. I think you probably expanded it. Yeah. You, you um, hit the wrong button to go forward. Okay. All right. All right. So. So here we are. Um, so do you know this guy? So we're not seeing your screen yet. Oh, so go back okay. And, go back and yeah, share it. Okay, all right. Huh? So I stop share. All right, let's see. Yeah. Okay. All right, very good. All right, let us see. Uh, go ahead and upload it. We're not seeing it yet. You're still not seeing it? All right. Not seeing it. So let's go in. And uh, did I stop share? You probably did, but you okay. could, you could share. We have a yeah, allow you to share. Okay. Let us co see. Co host. Oh, all right. I think I bounced into a little problem here. Uh, uh, let us see what is happening. Um. All right, there we are. Uh, Let's share our screen again. All right. Okay, so here we are. All uh, right. It's coming and, up. Yes. And then do full screen. Okay, so, so we look yep. at those assumptions. So I think the if you go take your arrow to the left. Mm-hmm. Dumb. Down below, down below. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so go to the right. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I know there I'm going go. to the right. Yes. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so we asked this question. These are the assumptions and the questions. Um, uh, and we are asking, these are the questions we are asking. We are asking, you know, is the source of biblical revelation different from the source of scientific discoveries? What is the subject of the Bible and what is the subject of scientific inquiry? 
What is the extent of the authority of scriptures over the scientific? What is the extent of the authority of scriptures over the scientific discipline? Very big question in this community. Mm -hmm. So let us look at these questions as best we can, given the scope of this conversation. Now, Evan, do you know who this guy is by any chance? <laughs> this is Galileo. <laughs> okay. So let's look at Galileo. Galileo, scriptures and the church. So Galileo is an Italian, was an Italian astronomer. He lived between 1564 and 1642. He was a devout Roman Catholic. And based on his own scientific observation, he agreed with Copernicus's heliocentric cosmology. And assuming, uh, uh, I don't know if there are high school persons here who just want to you know, break it down. And he wrote, um, he wrote a book, The Revolution Nibus Orbium Colestium. Actually, it means the revolution of the heavenly um, spheres or the uh, celestial <laughs> orbs. Um, and of course, cosmology, if you're a scientific, if you're a high school person here, cosmology these, it comes from the Greek word world. It means the origin and nature and destiny of the universe as a study of that. Heliocentric, helios comes from the term sun. So the idea is that the sun is the center of the universe, not the earth. So, um, so that was uh, uh, um, Com Copernicus's discovery. Now, um, so Galileo, of course, based on it a hundred years later, he developed the instruments to actually prove um, Galileo's theory. But there is, it is problematic. The church saw this as problematic. Um, let's see if we can push this thing up. Um, Joshua 10, 13, 12 to 13, <laughs> the church um, realizes it is clashing with what the scripture says, um, this heliocentric idea. And so what we have happening there my screen is kind of stuck again. Frozen. Uh, yeah, let's go. Yeah. So <laughs> this is Joshua 10, 12 to 13. On the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord and he said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Aijalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nations took vengeance on their enemies. It also, this heliocentric concept continues to clash with the Bible as far as the church is concerned. In 2 Chronicles 6.13, it says the world is firmly established, it shall never be moved. Psalm 19, 93, 1, he has established the world, it shall never be moved. Psalm 96.10, the world is firmly established, it shall never be moved. You set the earth on its foundation so it shall never be shaken. So it is said, of course, the heliocentric concept is that the earth orbits the sun <laughs> and not the other way around. And it is said that the church subjected Galileo to torture and banishment before first forcing him to recant, to back away from his scientific discovery. Why, of course, the long-held view of the church has been that the earth is the center of the universe, the geocentric cosmology, which actually was advanced by Aristotle, um, who lived 384 to 322. Of course, the church backed up this view with scriptures, as we can see there, um, how the church uses scriptures to back up that view. Now, the Catholic Church eventually accepted Copernicus's theory. However, <laughs> Protestant opposition led the church to ban it in, 17, in the 17th century, and the ban continued until 1835. Why was the Protestant opposition so significant? Because, you see, Protestants and protest Protestantism is known for its bibliocentricity. Some of us call it, it's biblio bibliolatry, <laughs> if you may understand the meaning of the term. Of course, the ban ended around 1835. And what may be significant about that is that 1835, 1685 to 1815, uh, uh, we have 
um, the fruits of the enlightenment there. And so uh, it became difficult for the church to oppose something that was so um, obviously scientific fact based on biblical texts. Now, let us look at what Martin Luther, who was your major uh, Protestant, how did he critique Copernicus' theory? And Martin Luther was a contemporary of Copernicus. Uh, Galileo was about 100 years after Copernicus. So here's what Martin Luther said, and I will cut it short and just focus on this part. He says, the fool, which is Copernicus, wants, uh, wants to turn the whole art of astronomy upside down. However, as Holy Scripture tells us, so did Joshua bid the sun to stand still, not the earth. <laughs> so here, Luther is again using the text in Joshua to oppose Copernicus's scientific discovery. So what is the dynamic at work here as far as scriptures and science? Scriptures is the are, are or, or you say scripture or scriptures are the tool that the church uses or uses to prove the valid validity of script of science. Sometimes say scripture is scripture. I will use the Bible eventually. Um, so that becomes a tool that the church uses to prove the validity of science. The reverse is also true. Science is a tool to disprove the validity of scriptures. Hmm. Which of the above is reasonable? Why? Why not? So what we have is the church uses, uses scriptures to prove the validity of science, whereas science often use um, uh, their discovery as tools to disprove the val validity of scripture. Are any of these two approaches reasonable? Let's see if we can answer the question as we move along. Because of this controversy, many have rejected the Bible. Many view science with suspicion at best and often with outrage at worst. And so may make up their own science to agree with their biblical assumptions. For example, we have had the resurrection of what we call the flat earth theory, yeah. where people are supposed to be educated are embracing this idea that the earth is flat. Um, and it seems to appear as part of a conflict between atheists who use science to suppress the Christian faith, and Christians who fight back, arguing that flat earth is based on biblical revelation, which is a literal interpretation of Revelation 7, where John saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of strife. So my, my argument here is that it is up to the faith-based institution to take up the responsibility, to explain carefully the nature of the Bible and the process of biblical inspiration in this case. Now, this is it. Heliocentrism is a foregone conclusion. And Galileo is named as the father of modern science. <laughs> not sure why not Copernicus. <laughs> My son argues he doesn't know why Galileo gets the credit for Copernicus's discovery. But does this mean that the Bible is not inspiring? Is it just a book filled with old fables? <laughs> Note I leave out the wives because I don't see any female authors there. <laughs> is it just a book filled with old fables? Um, so this is what a very wise lady, Ellen White, the prophet Advent of Adventism said many, many years ago. She said the Bible and she's very wise. A lot of people still are not able to grasp this concept. The Bible is written by inspired men, but it is not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put himself in words, in logic, in rhetoric, on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's Pen man, not his pen. Hmm. And then he says, you look at the different authors and you see how you know different they are. Um, so let us look at a few myths and facts regarding the Bible. Myth number one: the Bible fell from heaven in, in a black leather-bound book. I know you're all educated people, but let's not take anything for granted here. <laughs> the fact is that the Bible emerged from genuine human community 
and developed over a very long period of time. But what we have as the Bible today is a long process. Myth number two, the only true version of the Bible is the King James Version. Fact, the King James Version is a translation of the original <laughs> from the original Hebrew and Greek. Actually, King James Version did not come from the Hebrew and Greek, you know, uh, as all other versions. It, it, you know, King James Version had some middlemen there. Um, so even that, there are other versions that are, 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 are a lot more closer, a uh, lot closer to um, the original text, even though we have no original autographs of the scriptures. Um, they were all copied versions. All the authors wrote as they heard the voice of God dictating the words to them. That's myth number three. And the fact there is that though some books contain visions, the Bible contains various genres of literature, hymns, poetry, historical records, oral traditions passed on for many generations. Hymns were like, um, you, we have many of those in the Psalms that were written for worship in Israel. And all those come came out as poetry, historical records, Genesis account of creation, flood, etc. These are oral traditions passed on, they're eventually written down. You know, um, uh, the Gospels, oral tradition, not as long as perhaps the oral tradition um, of the traditions of the Pentateuch, but uh, nevertheless, they were um, originally oral traditions and so forth. Um, and of course, we find some authors like Luke will tell you where he got his work from. He did research, <laughs> he come up with it. But does this mean that the Bible is not inspired? Let us look some more at what Ellen White says about inspiration. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men who were inspired. Inspiration acts not on the man's words or on his expressions, but on the man himself, who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts. But the words and thoughts receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will. Thus the utterances of man are the words of God. So she says, the, to what extent are the utterances of human beings the word of God? God used them where they stood, where they were. That's what is happening here. So what we have is an inspirational work. We will look at that a little more. So the Bible, inspiration of the Bible is, an, is not an act. It's a process. Inspiration is a process. It is not an act. It is only the original, is it only the original authors that is that are inspired? Hmm? Is it only the original authors? How about the scribes, the compilers, the synods on canonization, the translator, the interpreters? It's a long process. So when we talk about inspiration of the Bible, we're talking about a long process um, that ends um, in interpretation and application. So in the case of the Bible, uh, Inspiration is a long and winding road by which the Spirit of God works with and among humans in community, from the point of origin to the point of delivery, as communities and individuals interpret and apply it from the place at which they stand. That is a wholesome view of inspiration of the Bible. So, um, as we say, the Bible the inspiration is an act, not a process. Now, there's a large and influential sect of Christendom that tends to make claims for the Bible that the Bible itself does not make. Claims that assert or even approach verbal inspiration. There's a particular world religion whose sacred text is said to have come directly from heaven to a single author. We should never be tempted to make such a claim for the Bible because it makes no such claim for itself. This does not in any way mean that the Bible is not inspired or supernatural. See, some weave false ideas around the Bible to render it supernatural. 
Others reject and ridicule the Bible because they come to understand the human frailties surrounding its production and their great human frailties surrounding its production. But this comes from a dualistic view between the natural and the supernatural, between the sacred and the secular. God works in the natural world to perform divine miracles. The supernatural manifests itself in the ordinary and everyday functions of life. That's something we need to uh, embrace so that we see how amazing is a mystery in which we stand. This is how the Bible has generally emerged. So let's ask the question, what are scriptures? I just want to move. We're going to come to some more serious, um, uh, well, we're going to, we're moving on here. What are the scriptures? Now, the word that we translate scriptures come, comes from the Greek word graphe, singular graphi, plural, writing or writings. So the word literally means writings. Now, the term Bible is not synonymous to the term scripture. Scripture is a general description of the sacred text of any religion. The Bible, from the Greek word biblion, which means book, is a sacred text of Christianity. Um, just as Tanakh is a sacred text of Judaism, Quran is a sacred text of Islam, Vedas in Hinduism, etc. And the Bible is a combination of the Judaic scriptures, Tanakh, and writings that developed out of the life of the first century Judaic sect that later became a religion called Christianity. So let's look at the Bible then. The Bible represents two, or represents the confluence of two great world religions, Judaism and its offering, offspring Christianity, becoming the canon of Judeo-Christian tradition. So emerging from this great religious tradition, the Bible has shaped human civilization as no other world religion or, or no other sacred text actually has. From the biblical tradition, the world today advocates human worth, human rights, and human freedom. This is something that has been sort of buried in, in, in other um, uh, uh, texts, so to speak. The Bible tells a coherent story that is a profound paradigm of history. It is a human struggle to reunite with its infinite source. And we're moving to understand what the Bible is all about and see if we can put this in the context of science. The Bible did not fall from the sky, as I said. It sprang up out of genuine human struggles that reflect the multifaceted nature of human relationships, human understanding and misunderstanding, human vice and virtue. You read the Bible, it's all there in it. The Bible is a literary site at which one may observe the divine struggle with the human, directing it on its way forward. So without this acute vision of the Bible, one loses its most profound symbolic and nuanced meanings and we fail to grasp it as a proclamation of liberation rather than a weapon of mind control, rather than as something we use to tell people what is true and what is not true, what is right and what is not right as far as facts, scientific facts and so forth. So we say then the Bible is a proclamation. The Bible is not a textbook of science or history or psychology or any other academic subject. The Bible is a proclamation of divine love and human freedom. Jesus and Paul also tells us what it's about. In Matthew 12, Jesus says, in everything do to others as you have them do to you. This is the law and the prophets. Again, Jesus says, you know, when they ask Jesus, what, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love God with all your heart, soul, and might. And then he says, the second, that's the greatest. The second is like it. It's the same as it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. Now, 
I highlighted in red law and the prophets because a lot of people do not realize that when Jesus says refer to the law and the prophets, he's referring to the scriptures. That's what he was referring to the scriptures available to them at the time. So it's not, um, you know, about 10 commandments or something of the sort. He's saying the scriptures are really about love. It's, you say it's a proclamation of divine love and human freedom. Now, so as I said, the Bible is not a textbook. If Joshua or other biblical authors did not know that the sun does not move around the earth, it is not because he, whoever wrote it, was not inspired. It's because he was not involved in a scientific debate. The author is not trying to teach science. The author is explaining a miracle in the way people understood the world back then. If Joshua lived in the 21st century, he would describe the miracle based on our common knowledge about the world today. As Ellen White said, it is not the words that are inspired, but the people themselves. So the Bible is not a science book. The Bible is a proclamation. The Bible is thematic, not a subject specific text. The theme is divine love and grace. This theme seeks its way through the flawed humanity that shows up in the Bible. <laughs> you read the Bible, you see it there. So this calls for careful, responsible interpretation and application. As we say, Jesus offers a hermeneutic. hermeneutic. We looked at that in Matthew 7, 12, a few slides ago. Matthew 22, 7, 37 to 40. I call it a hermeneutic of liberation. Um, that's just my name for it. But that's the hermeneutic. That is what we measure the scriptures against. That's the law and the prophets. That's what scripture is about. So any interpretation, anything you come out from scripture that is not embracing that, you have misused the scripture. So let's come now <laughs> to move further to the heart of our questions. The God of scriptures is also the God of science. As Christians, we have to embrace that, I hope. All knowledge about the life of the universe comes from God. The God who seeks to shine the light of love through the scriptures is the same God who reveals mysteries to Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, Max Planck, Steve Jobs, and on and on. So this leads me, you know, as I reflect, to ask, what is the word of God? Is your smartphone based on the word of God? <laughs> so we talk about scriptures as the word of God. We talk about divine revelation as the word of God. Did Einstein receive revelation from God? Can we refer to that as the word of God? So let, 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 let's, let's, let's look at what we're talking about when we talk about the word of God. In the, script, in the strictest sense, scriptures and word of God are not equivalent terms. Let me take a little time to think. To, to. Now, what Ellen White and the rest of us call the word of God refers to a written text, such as the Bible and the recitations we make from it. But this is not what the Bible itself refers to as the word of God. The eternal word of God manifests itself in all revealed knowledge. Hmm. Now, how? what do we mean by that? Now, look at the term we translate word. The term we can't translate word is the Greek term logos. We're going to look at that. But before we look at it, let's look at where we are introduced to the word of God in its most significant eternal way that's in the prologue of John's gospel. And here John presents a creation story that was quite um, popular in his time and he uses it to show and to demonstrate the way in which the life of God manifests in the world with Jesus as the archetype of that manifestation. So in John one, it says, 
the Logos was in the beginning. And I'm translating here straight from the Greek text. So I read it straight from the Greek text and put it here. The Logos was in the beginning. And I put that in bracket because there is no that in the text. The Logos was in beginning and the Logos was with God and the Logos was no different from God. This Logos was in beginning with God. Through it, all things exist. And apart from it, nothing exists. What exists in it was life. And the life was the light of humanity. And then in verse 14, he says, the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. I want to come back to this term, arche, which we translate as beginning. I will come back to it on another slide, but I put it there in brackets so we understand really what it's talking about. So note, I didn't use the term word there. I use the Greek word logos. Why? Because the Greek term logos is not equivalent to the English term word. We translate it as word, but it's not an equivalent. Word in English is a basic unit of thought in a sentence. But logos in Greek and in the context of John's gospel is a rational force in the universe through which divine mystery manifests itself in the sentient world. So that's why John says all things came through it. And John uses this well-known creation story to show how Jesus manifests the very life that is God. He's the archetype of the logos that is eminent in the world, the life of God. But John goes further to say that the Jesus story is a demonstration of the manifestation of logos in humanity. And I won't um, uh, 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 spend a lot of time on that because that's a whole other subject by itself. But it's important to see that many academic disciplines and other attempts at understandings contain the suffix logi, right? Biology, sociology, etc. That is coming from the Greek term logos. Logos is the reason and wisdom of being. Logos is the ground of existence, which John calls arche. Arche, remember um, in the slide before it says the word was in beginning, arche. Beginning is not referring to time. The term arche in Greek philosophy, which John builds on, is not about time. It's about the very ground of being. That's what arche is in Greek philosophy. So the, the logos in beginning, that is, the logos resides in the very ground of being. That is being. And it's a very uh, profound philosophy that John presents that um, uh, we, have, we are yet to really explore. Now, so... The scriptures, if I may, did I saw? So let's go back. The scriptures, which the Greek word hygraphy and the word hologos are not one of the same thing. So I repeat, the scriptures and the logos, these are not equivalent terms. When Ellen White says the Bible is the word of God, she's talking about word in different way you know in terms of what is proclaimed what is said but here the word that the bible speaks of is different from the scripture itself so that is why for example john 5 39 john has jesus saying you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life but they are the things that testify about me and remember john presents jesus as the architect typical, the archetype of the Logos itself, the manifestation of, of the presence of God. And so then, the authority of scripture is the very Logos to which it, uh, uh, to which it testifies, the Logos. But as I said, Logos, Jesus is archetype of the Logos. But Logos is really the presence, the manifestation of being, of the life, the very life that is God. It is the being of God, as John 1 verse 1 says. The Logos was no different from God. So the Logos itself incarnates in Jesus of Nazareth as love of God. But the Logos seeks also to incarnate in humanity. In fact, John's concept of the Logos 
tells an essential story. And the essential story that John tells is that the Logos seeks to incarnate in humanity. And if I may compare these two texts in John, in the Johannine writings, the writings of John, in John 1, 18, John says no one has ever seen God. In 1 John, I should say 1 John, that's not John. 1 John, 1 John 4, 12, uh, let me go back there. In 1 John 4, 12, it also says no one has ever seen God. All right, please note that is 1 John. 1 John 4, 12, it also says no one has ever seen God. Now, when it says no one has ever seen God in the gospel, it says it's the only son who has made him known. And then the next time when he says no one has ever seen God, he says, if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. John is making a profound point there <laughs> that Jesus comes to tell us what it means to be, to manifest the very life that is God. And so the whole point of scripture is love. The love us points to the oneness of God. It says all things came through it. All things came from one source, our K, the very ground of being. And as such, the point that John makes is that God is one. It's one totality. And of course, Paul takes up this idea in Romans 3.30 with, uh, uh, with this conflict between Jews and Gentiles. And he says, God is one. There is only one source of life. God is one. So the Logos also points then to the immanence of God, which says the Logos incarnates, meaning God is always present in all human affairs, all of them. The Logos incarnates in humanity as love. And therefore, based on all I've, I've been said, I want to propose what I call a Logos hermeneutic, where we look at the question of science and scriptures. A Logos hermeneutic embraces the oneness and immediacy of being. God incarnate. The Jesus story declares that God is present. I am calling humankind into full consciousness of being. As such, it approaches the scripture from the standpoint of ethics, not dogma, not science. Now, <clears throat> A Logos hermeneutic will free the scripture. Um, let's go back on that. A Logos hermeneutic frees the scripture, that is the Bible, from the conditions that interpreters place upon its authenticity. What do I mean by that? The inspiration of scripture lies in its witness to the Logos, not in the means or the nature of that witness, which in many places may be flawed. As Ellen White says, God is not on trial in the Bible. And so if we accept that the Logos is the very spirit of life, to deny the reality of various genres and sources of scripture in the interest of a narrow view of inspiration is in the end counterproductive to conditionally or to unconditionally accepting the Bible as a witness to the incarnation. So if we uh, uh, accept that, then we will accept the Bible unconditionally. We will not try to place conditions upon it. It has to say this, it has to be literal, it has to have literal meanings, or it has to be correct, all right? Divine voice is present in every vehicle of human and understanding, and the scripture reflects various vehicles. So this is what I say, Bible thumping fundamentalism, requires everything to be literal and accurate. Scripture rejecting liberalism requires everything to fit its version of reality. Both of these place conditions on scripture. The scripture is what it is, flawed human vehicle of divine revelation. And that in and of itself is a witness to the miracle of the Logos incarnation, that God incarnates, God uses the imperfect human vehicle to reveal what God wishes to reveal to human beings. So <clears throat> let's uh, move on further. Uh, what did I do here? Uh, I 
think you could to accept scientific or historical findings that may run contrary to what appears in scripture does not necessarily disavow the authority of scriptures. So let me give you a little time to think about that. To accept scientific or historical findings that may run contrary to what appears in scripture does not necessarily disavow the authority of scriptures. If we accept the logos, the word, as radically present being of God, if we accept that, then perhaps it means that we should also affirm all knowledge and understanding of the creation and human affairs as divine revelation. To accept the Logos as radically present being of God is to affirm all knowledge and understanding of the creation and human affairs as divine revelation. Now, a radical monotheism, and what do I mean by radical monotheism? If we really believe that God is one, we cannot assign the vast body of knowledge obtained since the close of the biblical canon to some other. In a sense, then, to disregard science may be in and of itself to disregard the true authority of scripture if the authority of scripture is the logos, the logos, the eternal word. The Bible claims no other discipline outside of its own discipline. That is, it witnesses to the redemptive presence of God in the creative historical process. Scripture testifies that divine revelation fills up time and space. God is present, I am. And so it seems to me, and I may be speaking very strongly here, but you can tell me, it seems to me that to for scientists to measure the authenticity of scripture with scientific data or for theologians to use scripture to measure the accuracy of science, to me, it seems to be an exercise in futility. Have we learned anything from the case of Galileo and Copernicus? What if we prioritize, for example, the profound lessons of grace, salvation, human responsibility in the story of creation over the obsession with the scientific facts? There's so much obsession over that when the story is telling us so many deep things about who we are and what we ought to be, and we forget that. Will we hear the creation story in ways it yearns to be heard towards renewal and restoration? I am not making any scientific arguments on creation here. I'm simply saying, what if we hear what the story actually wants to tell us? The next point I want to make is this. Human responsibility increases proportionally to the increase of knowledge. Some ideas and cultural values of the past reflected in the scriptures emerge from a place of knowledge that is significantly less than where we are now. We know a lot more today about the creation and the nature of life than the biblical authors did. A lot more. For example, Aristotle, Remember Aristotle and his geocentric view of the universe that <laughs> many people use the scripture to, uh, to, to uh, verify? Aristotle perpetuated in the ancient world the idea that woman was an incomplete <laughs> or mutilated man. <laughs> he says the male is the ultimate realization of humanity. So for him, the female is ontologically inferior. And of course, this idea re uh, uh, is reflected in the Bible. 
<laughs> those places where you see, uh, you know, <laughs> these ideas of women and female subordination to male and all those things, all those household codes that Aristotle himself advanced. This was based on Aristotle's biology. <laughs> So just give you an example of how um, many of those cultural values that we see reflected in scripture are coming from a place of knowledge that is significantly less than where we are now. And so I want to say this in summing up, wrapping up. To behold the logos in scripture is to embrace what God continues to reveal towards the upliftment of humanity. The logos, the word of God, speaks to divine omniscience, love, justice, providence, and grace, out of which a perpetually developing and learning humanity emerges. And all that learning takes place through the sciences, the humanities, the arts, and all the disciplines, the beautiful ways in which God continues to show up in the human process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So definitely entertain questions from both in person as well as uh, online. Um, for those of you in person, it might be best to actually put your questions in the chat unless you want to come up front. Um, I just want to reaffirm what you were saying about Aristotle, because I, I'll send you, uh, you probably already have it, at least 20 different things that Aristotle got wrong and was influencing you know, religion and the church. One of them is really fascinating to me, is that he said that females have less teeth than men. Now I'm thinking about this saying, couldn't you just count? I mean, like, couldn't you just simply count rather than making this uh, type of statement? So yeah, a lot of um, Christianity for a long time was revolving around Aristotle. So that's something that, you know, is really interesting and you emphasize that here again. Um, did you want to say anything more about Aristotle? No, um, uh, all those who know Aristotle, um, you know, like I said, a lot of Aristotle's what, I don't know, Aristotle was either not as smart as the whole world thinks he is, or he was just misogynist, I don't know which one of them. <laughs> But um, but uh, a lot of our values, uh, a lot of it show up in, in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, for example, those household codes in Ephesians chapter five um, of submission, um, those were uh, based on Aristotle's um, concept uh, uh, there of the hierarchical structure um, in how home and society, and of course, uh, for him, females were, uh, were ontologically inferior. That is why they had to submit to their husbands. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of people don't realize that those ideas come out of those, those concepts uh, of humanity. And then uh, once we get updated on those, then we realize that we don't hold to those ideas anymore. And, and so a lot of the things that we, we take in the Bible and we uh, use them as dogma and doctrine, they come from a place of knowledge that is significantly less than where we are today. That's right. Um, That's so. right. Other questions or comments? I see one question in the chat. Um, how can you separate the Bible from science or science from the Bible? Real science proves what is told in the Bible and science is only a way of describing what God has done. Okay. Hmm. Well, the question is, I'd like to answer the question with a question. What is it that is told in the Bible that you're talking about? What specifically? Yeah, I, I don't understand the question to you. Um, this question came from Sean. Is Sean online? Because you could unmute if you wish. Uh, 
If not, we could go on to other questions or comments. If you are online, you could unmute and ask your question. Yeah. Something that I've found very helpful is to consider for each area of discipline, what several questions like, what is the purpose? What is it that they're trying to understand? And therefore, what questions are they asking? And what is the place that they go to find those answers? Because in my concept, each area of knowledge is a part of the total. And uh, you know, there's a story about the blind people trying to describe an elephant mm -hmm. and they come up with different descriptions because they're looking at different parts of it. Right. And uh, I, I think of knowledge in totality as being have as com being composed of different aspects simply because as humans our ability for one person to know everything about every area even if they had the capacity mentally to take a lifetime to delve deeply and so we tend to specialize and that's similar to in medicine with various physicians they specialize in different parts of the body and it doesn't mean that the other parts are not important. So if we ask the questions, if we understand the tools used to investigate that area, and if we understand the limits of the investigation process in those areas, I think there'll be less likelihood of people in different areas fighting against each other mm -hmm. to maintain that I have the Mm -hmm. true knowledge mm -hmm. about everything, mm -hmm. even areas that are not addressed by their speciality. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, indeed. And uh, I, I had a, 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 a statement here from a, a, a Christian moral philosopher called H. Willard Niebuhr. And he says that the Christ event as the Logos manifestation is a demonstration of oneness in being so that all institutions, all religions, maybe some of us won't like this, all ideological processes, all nations, all cultural activities, all scientific breakthroughs, all life forms, all living experience connect in the one. So he talks about the one, uppercase one, beyond the many. Mm -hmm. And I think Paul wanted to talk about that when they, they had this conflict between Jews and Gentiles and between various cultural approaches to the gospel. And Paul is saying, God is one, <laughs> you know, God is one. And, and so, you know, it is, it is sort of uh, so uh, uh, counter and non-life affirming for us to be pulling against each other rather than come together and say, what did you find? <laughs> Right. All right, let's look Agreed. at it rather than say, from my standpoint, this has to be wrong because so and so and so. To some, to some degree also, I think that religion has co-opted the word inspiration, mm -hmm. but because inspiration could come in every field based on what you said, right? Inspiration from God about the knowledge and the truth of the world is something that okay so so i think based on what you're saying and one of the things that you made in terms of equivalency is that all revealed knowledge is um, either the word of God you said or logos. I'm not really yes. Clarifying. Yeah, if it's if it's if God reveals to us, that is the logos. That is word of God, because word of God is not confined to the Bible. Mm -hmm. If it's the logos, remember Jesus says the logos, and 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 you know Jesus is saying it, but it is John records it because that's what John is trying to tell us. <laughs> That the Logos manifests, it's life itself. Jesus is this archetype of, of the Logos and comes to show us how we can manifest that um, in the way we live, you know, and, and so forth. And of course, John didn't have time to pull that apart, but we can pull that apart and, and flesh that out. Um, yes. 
So E equal MC squared is the logos, is part of the logos. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Yes. Okay. And as I say, it's no, it's no, it's no, <laughs> it's no coincidence. It's called biology or just zoology. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's logos. <laughs> yes. Yes. One of the, another statement in the chat, one of the ongoing challenges is that members believe that if an idea is in the Bible, such as the household codes, that is enough. You just read the Bible and that is sufficient. This is this causes problem for the church. This is from Dexter Richardson. Yes, it does. Because um, again, we have to see where it's coming from. Like I said, a lot of things come from a place of knowledge significantly less than where we are today. A place of knowledge about human beings. And I gave... To me, the, the very it's good that that happened in history. That you know, Copernicus and 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 Luther and Galileo and the Church. That it it just proves the extent to which we cannot be taking this Bible literally. We have to read the Bible from where it is. It is not a science book. It is a proclamation, and that proclamation comes from the place at which the authors were, what they understood about the world. All right, some hands are up here. Some hands. So you guys, uh, if you're online, again, you could unmute and ask or make com comments. Um, Martin, you want to go first? Okay. Hello, Olive. It's good to see you again. Hi, Martin. And uh, Martin may, should be given this presentation. You know, oh, he's, he's given, thing. he's given, he's had his turn. Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> yes, yes. Welcome. <laughs> welcome through Zoom to Andrews University. Thank and you. Thank you for exploring with us this, this intercession of science and theology. Uh, I just wanted to make a little comment, uh, piggybacking on your quotation from Luther mm -hmm. and see what you think about my perspective here. It seems to me that the mistake Luther made. Oh, you went mute, uh, Martin. Ma Martin, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. Yes, I, I wanted to make a comment on Luther. You, you gave an interesting quotation from Luther early in your presentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you tell me what you think about my comment. It seems to me that Luther made a mistake in wedding his interpretation of scripture to the science of his time. Yes. So that his complaint about Copernicus is not just that Copernicus disagreed with scripture, but his complaint about Copernicus was that Copernicus was overturning astronomy. <laughs> Co Copernicus was changing the science. Yes. He had a problem with Copernicus making progress in science because he had linked his biblical interpretation with the science that preceded Copernicus. Yes. But nowadays, yes. we have accepted the revolution of Copernicus and Galileo. Mm -hmm. And so we easily find ways of harmonizing scripture with what we know yes. from science nowadays. Yes. yes. Uh, and, and, but the danger is that we'll do the same thing today. We yeah. will choose the science that we like mm -hmm. and link our theological interpretation with it. And mm -hmm. then when science progresses, we're upset with science for progressing because we are committed to defending the old science. Yes. And it seems to me that this is the mistake that, that Luther made and it's the mistake that we continue to make in various generations. Yep. And I think we need to pay attention to what scripture itself tells us. Mm -hmm. For example, in Proverbs 4.18, the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more onto the perfect day. Yes. So that long history you shared with us about how the Bible came to be what it is demonstrates this progressive revelation yes. over time, even in the formation of scripture. Yes. And this progressive revelation happens also through scientific investigation. So we should get used to the idea that we must grow and grow up in our knowledge Yes. And we must avoid the mistake that Luther made, which is to tie our interpretation of scripture too closely to an old science and yes. therefore find ourselves fighting against the new science. Yes. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. You you said it, you have said it perfectly. Um, uh, um, um, Martin, I, I, I don't know if, <laughs> if as a, if, if we may talk about church, in church or faith community that opposes scientific breakthroughs, 
um, will soon win the battle if the case of Galilee and Copernicus is 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 if is is going to be a case in point. Um, and yeah, you've said it perfectly, and it it is a dilemma in which we are right now. Um, that uh, we don't like we don't like our established ideas to be upset uh, by science, um, and so we demonize the science. Uh, and I'm saying um, that is not something that that if we are looking at God's revelation throughout history, as I say, the path of the just is, is like a shining light. Um, if we are indeed immersed in the spirit of God that is always present with us, then perhaps we, we take a different approach mm -hmm. um, to science. Uh, Dr. Hemmings, this is Dexter Richardson in North Carolina. And I wanna ask you, do you think that the Adventist church is lost its sense of progressive truth and present truth. I mean, it seems to me that the Adventist church is going backwards uh, rather than forward. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that in general. Well, I, my topic today is scriptures and science. <laughs> and um, yes. if any anyone here is in SDA history, but I, I must say, you know, as a, a theologian in the church, um, I, I don't want to make a value judgment as to whether we're going backward or forward. Um, all I want to say is that we should keep pressing on. We should keep struggling against um, our, the fear that we have of attaching ourselves to our own human understanding and, and, and not moving on uh, uh, as God would have us move on to understand more and to and to improve uh, the life of the community based on what we understand. Because I think that there are some things that if we understand them better um, in terms of what science is and what the Bible is about, then I think it will improve our community mm -hmm. um, to a great extent. Um, I agree. Yeah. Thanks. Dr. Novak, Dave, could on mute. Um, unmute, unmute. Okay. All right, there you go. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, a wonderful presentation. I'm I'm grateful for your insight. Uh, I think we need to also re recall and and always have in the back of our minds, you know, how science itself is a is, is a purely human construct and actually is provisional in just about well in all of its aspects. You you. You know, there is a uh, the idea of the frontal lobotomy in which they go up and they there's a per, you know you swipe the brain and uh, you you have a tremendously altered form of behavior. Did you realize that that received the Nobel Prize? There's a person who received the Nobel Prize for doing the frontal lobotomy, and now it's a completely discredited uh, scientific or medical uh, activity. Uh, and so I think both in both in scientific discovery uh, in biblical discovery, we need to understand that all of that is provisional, that as we work to understand what the Bible has to say for us and what science has to say, we need to approach it with humility and with a, a sense of the idea that we what we know now is this. But God will lead us to greater understanding as we press forward, as we continue to progress in our understanding uh, about what God has in mind for us, both in the scientific and in the spiritual realm through understanding his, his word and his Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A very good observation that, you know, science, we have to understand, too, that as much as um, religion uh, tends to be ideological, so science also tends to be ideological. And, and both religion and science need to 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 try to uh, keep away from the path of ideology, you know, <laughs> and, and really focus on really seeking to understand and seeking to make the world a better place. You know? I, I so, think that's yeah. one of the things that we as educators especially in a Christian uh, setting, needs to really emphasize with our students that all knowledge is rolling disclosure. 
-hmm. Rolling disclosure may not be a good thing when you go to court <laughs> and you're telling the judge stuff, but for nature, for the you know nature, for spiritual things, it's all rolling disclosure. And part of the question I have is, why is it set up that way? Um, you know, we we have advancements in science. Um, for the longest while, there were even scientists who didn't believe in the atom. You know, um, why is it set up that way? Um, is it because of our own human limitations? Is it that we can't grasp all of it? Just imagine if God were to drop all knowledge upon us <laughs> right now. Could yeah. we handle it? Yeah. And I don't know. It's, it's human beings. We have this fear of of having to let go and move on. It, it's we tend to to attach ourselves to what is familiar, mm -hmm. yeah, and 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 it's not helpful. It has proven to be not helpful. That that somehow um, we need to develop that kind of spiritual strength and spiritual capacity to realize that. Um, you know, life is is a is a growing thing. It's a moving thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I you know I keep saying to my students, one of the reasons why I want to live like 20, 30, 40 more years is that I'm, I'd love to see what next. What <laughs> you know? That's right. What what That's will right. we understand next? Um, but there are some people who don't like that. In fact, even in the science world, yeah. um, where we, I think we say called is Newtonian science and quantum science. Mm -hmm. where the uh, um, Newtonian scientists, they're still very, you know, peevish or, or did I say very afraid of the where quantum science is going because it's really taking us in, deep into the mysteries of the universe. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much fear. Even among religious people, there's so much fear because it's like becoming the new religion, mm -hmm. um, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, there is just so much uh so much we do not know and i am excited about it right. and i wish everybody would be excited about it and uh, and realize that god is and and uh you know the fact that you believe something don't mean, don't mean that it is right wrong or real um you believe it you know but you open yourself the important thing is to know that god is and that we we simply trust uh we we what did I say? Rest and trust in the mystery that is God. And let that mystery take us along. <laughs> and I think it becomes difficult. We, we we just want to control things. That's the thing. We want to control knowledge. We want to control, you know, we feel that if we don't hold it and control it, everything will go chaotic. And mm. the point is, even though we're controlling it, it's still chaos. <laughs> you know? That reminds me uh, Olive, about an interesting point you made in your presentation about the Bible as a, a book of liberation. Yes. Rather than a book of mind control. Yes, yes. And uh, and we need to really digest that point. Yes. Because sometimes, oftentimes, we use the Bible to try to control the way other people think. Yes. My yes. interpretation of the Bible needs to be accepted by you. And if not, yes. I want to silence you. Yes. Uh, that can happen in religious institutions as well. Yes. But uh, that's happening. not that's not what the Bible is given for, to, to control point. other people's thinking. It's given as an instrument of liberation. Yes. So are we really interested in liberation or are we interested in mind control? That's the question that you challenge us with here today. Yes. Yep. Yes. That is it. And, uh, and I'd, like to add, uh, I'd like to add two. Okay. <laughs> Am I interrupting somebody? No, no, no. Go ahead and then oh. we get to Gary. Gary is on yeah. there. I'd, yeah. I'd like to add, too, that a true scientist and a true theologian will approach their area of, of search for truth with the same spirit of humility and openness, recognizing that there's no human understanding that must not change. And it needs to be, the Bible talks about the, you know, knowledge of God being as a shining light that goes more and more to the perfect day. And if you look at the history of, well, let's say chemistry. Right. And because I love teaching the history of chemistry because I show students how 
as more and more discoveries were made, how the concepts and the theories changed because yeah. they needed to change to reflect the reality that was found from observations. Yeah. And uh, one of the problems is that today people see science as this body of knowledge that is firm and fixed and mm -hmm. the scientists know everything and you must listen to what they say, not understanding that the process, science is more a process of discovery. Mm -hmm. And with that openness of mind, then we are always, we, we, sh we, we should always be looking to see what concepts actually fit with the observations and, and what theories best explain the totality of the observations. Of course, none of us has access to, to all of the observations. So we depend on those who report. And that's where, when we try to find out what actually is a valid reporting of observations, not just interpretation of observations, is that can be challenging, especially mm -hmm. when you get different um, presentations by different experts, quote unquote, in the field. But that openness of attitude, I think, is necessary both to the theologian and to the scientist. Mm -hmm. Of course, the theologian or the person who is studying, trying to study both the scriptures and to know the logos, <laughs> um, recognizes that there's special divine um, knowledge, presence and interpretation that is needed, not just human understanding. Mm -hmm. In a yes. special way. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whether, as you say, whether we're theologians or scientists, um, it takes humility. And there's a theologian who is not humble, who wants certainty, who thinks they know everything. This is it. You don't like it. Leave. And there's a scientist who, this is it. This is the discovery. Don't rock the boat. Don't come to me with, don't come with these. They, they, they do that in science too. Oh, well, yeah, they know? do. Yeah. <laughs> um, scientists have lost their job because they rock the boat. <laughs> they say yeah. they challenge the theory, establish theory. Um, and, and, and that's what we're trying to say. We need to be open to the word that is God, that is the very presence of God that is always revealing <laughs> to us the mysteries of the universe. And but, I like how you differentiate between the scriptures and the logos. Yes. I'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gary. So I'm Gary Burdick. Uh, welcome. I uh, want to respond to what you said and also what uh, Desmond said uh, with a quote. Uh, Walter Maunder was a famous British astronomer at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. And in 1908, he wrote a book, Astronomy in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he talked about everything that astronomy had taught them in the previous century. And then he made this comment. All these wonderful results have been attained by the free exercise of men's mental abilities. And it cannot be imagined that God would have intervened to hamper their growth and in intellectual power by revealing to men facts and methods which it was within their own ability to discover for themselves. We therefore did not find any reference in the Bible to that which modern astronomy has taught us. Yet it may be noted that some expressions appropriate at any time have become much more appropriate, much more forcible in light of our present day knowledge. And I think it's important that it is a growth process. And when we're doing science, we are developing and we're developing our God-given abilities mm -hmm. uh, as we do the science. And so when you look to the scriptures, you look to those things that science can't tell us. Mm -hmm. But if there's something that we can go out and do our experiment and discover in nature there's no reason for God to have given us those details in scripture because we can find it through the exercise of our God-given abilities. Mm -hmm. I think that to me, that's written in 1908, but it's certainly a hundred and uh, more years later, it's still very still appropriate true. to us today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for God to put those in scripture, the world could not hold a book that is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. As you say, the scripture has its purpose, you know. Yeah. That's it's, it's a proclamation. Proclamation of divine love and the liberation that comes through that. And 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 that is what Jesus said. This is what the scripture is about. Mm -hmm. This this I always say he says, 
Jesus says, in everything do to others as you'd have them do to you. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. In fact, the second he says is like the first. So if you don't have the second, you don't have the first. Now, these, these seem all seem simple. But as religious people, we have all these rules and laws and policies and gone, all of this stuff, because that seemed just too simple. And so we end up violating those very principles in all the rules and laws and stuff that we, you know, pile on. And, and then, and that, interestingly, that, on the matter of biblical rules and laws, in, in Scripture itself, we see examples of how what was a law gets modified. For example, the law of circumcision, mm -hmm. big thing in the Old Testament. And then the Apostle Paul comes along and says, well, you can circumcise your Jewish Christians, but leave my Gentile churches alone. We don't, <laughs> we don't have to be circumcised. And they thought about it and discussed it and prayed. And they said, yeah, we can allow that. Uh, we, we, we won't enforce the law of circumcision on the Gentile Christians. So I argue that careful study of scripture itself mm. will illustrate for us that how we apply religious laws ought to change over time. Yes. But we haven't paid attention to that. We just keep on defending the law as we have had it before. Mm. And we don't learn from scripture that mm. the spirit of the law transcends the letter of the law yeah. and can be applied in different ways at different times as our knowledge increases. Yes. Yeah. And, and that part, as our knowledge increases, we, we have to be responsible for all the knowledge we have gained since the close of the canon, which is, which is, uh, what's the word, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, which is phenomenal amount of knowledge we have. And he says, look, we pretend as it doesn't exist because we want to hold on to these, you know, dogmas and doctrines that we gained from the Bible or we got from the Bible. So I'm just wondering, why do we bother to have smartphones? All some of the most, uh, you know, the biggest Bible thumpers, they're the most adept on the smartphone. This is scientific discovery, you know. <laughs> yeah. So an another example from chemistry about how things that are familiar to us influence how we see the world. So today, of course, we think about bonding, forming bonds in chemistry as ionic and molecular and hydrogen bonded. Do you know at one point in time that bonding between two atoms was considered the model, the model was considered as a hook and eye. Do you remember hook and eye? That mm -hmm. for different for clothes, you put a hook and an eye. That was that was the model that was used at some point for bonding. So we use stuff that we are familiar with to try to understand the world, but then, you know, we have to grow up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Indeed. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I know we've gone past it by a lot, but the conversation is sweet. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm glad you find it that way. <laughs> yes. Thank you so very much. I knew this was going to be great. Thank you for giving us more uh, insight. And I, for one, um, have um, see things better. I'm going to go back and listen to it and see your points and all of that and grow, hopefully grow from this, um, this presentation today. Okay. Thank you so very much. It's, it was good to close out our seminar program for this year. And we want to thank all of you who participated here as well. Thanks for having me. Totally. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks. Okay. Good it was a pleasure for awesome. me. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Sure. All Bye -bye. right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.